Sure, there were racing games in the 80s, the 90s, but let's be honest, it was the 2000s where it really all kicked off. The improvement was exponential, from massive polygons to millions of tiny ones. It was a time for those who had grown up with a PlayStation in the house to graduate from Tonka toys to digital recreations. Gran Turismo, Test Drive, Need for Speed, they all came of age in the 2000s. And here's seven of those magnificent games that transcend the rest. And if you're watching this at any point you think to yourself, yes, I played that, it was great, then do remember to hit the like button. And then subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to make sure you see everything from Goodwood Road and Racing. Well, this feels remarkably like deja vu from our list of the best games of the 2010s, doesn't it? Ask us to name a better driving sim and we'll name 10 without even thinking about it. But few car games have affected car culture in general for better or worse quite as profoundly as the Need for Speed franchise. It would be to do them a disservice to just pick one, so consider this to be one entry for 2002's Hot Pursuit 2, 2003's Underground, 2004's Underground 2, 2005's Most Wanted and 2006 Carbon. The reach of Need for Speed spans everything from blazing across a desert in a Porsche Carrera GT concept in Hot Pursuit's supercar extravaganza to bolting neons onto a 1.1 litre Peugeot 106 for a top shelf photo shoot in Underground. The beauty of Need for Speed in the 2000s was that whatever your dream, whether it was the latest top-end supercar or the cover star of Max Power, you could find a game to fulfil it and the right environment in which to drive it. While the earlier 2000s games stuck to the original format, run away from the cops, Most Wanted and Carbon became fairly convincing mixtures of a Halfords car park and the Gumball 3000. Both utterly different ends of motoring culture, both catered for. I heard you were back in town. For four glorious years, Need for Speed stuck to what it was good at, playfully celebrating the widest breadth of car culture and arcade silliness. And then, Pro Street came about and tried to be serious and, well, yeah. Could this be the last properly great Gran Turismo game? I'm sure 5 was good, 6 large, and GT Sport has become the benchmark for online gaming, and GT7 looks like it could be a cracker, online issues apart, but 4, well, it was nearly perfect. It was perhaps the most faithful to the principle of real driving simulator of the lot. It came seven years after the launch of the original Gran Turismo, and at that point, Kazunori Yamauchi's famous fetishism for perfection hadn't started to hold his games back. Instead, the tinkering created a nearly perfect for its time and utterly unrivaled game. The graphics, physics, car list and game content seemed generations ahead of any of its competitors, and it remains to this day not only one of the best games of the 2000s, but of all time. Gran Turismo 4 had 700 cars from 80 manufacturers that spanned 130 years of motoring history and future. The career mode was so dense that we would wager that less than 0.1% of users have ever completed it. I certainly didn't. There were even actual 24-hour races you could do on the Nordschleife. At the time, it was astonishing, and every edition since has cowered under the weight of expectation created by Gran Turismo 4. Maybe GT7 has finally pushed the boundaries back forward again for the Gran Turismo series, but to be totally honest, we're just as tempted to replay GT4 as we are to open up Gran Turismo 7. The game had the Mark I Ford Focus WRC on its cover in martini colours. That's pretty much enough said. Colin McRae Rally 2.0 took what made Colin McRae Rally so revolutionary and refined it. It took rallying games in a new direction, away from the arcade nature of Sega Rally and into the real world of rallying and even Rally Cross. There was a proper multiplayer, cleaner menus, better graphics and cars from the real world that set the tone for the game that was underneath the visuals. The fact that the two British rally stars of the time could have major games named after them then, and few could name Elfin Evans today, showcases how far rallying has fallen in the UK now. But back then, Richard Burns and Colin McRae fought it out on the virtual stages as well as real. 
Perhaps Burns game was more realistic, but McRae's was more playable and set the tone for rallying games to come. The influence still exists today as the series moved away from its sadly lost namesake to become Dirt Rally. Hmm, an underground racing game from the makers of Grand Theft Auto, you say? Sounds like a good idea to us. Much like Need for Speed, Midnight Club tried to explore the more underground, homegrown side of car culture, away from the slick, polished cars of Gran Turismo. None of the games better showcase this idea than Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition. I wanna race you for real. House real big, cars real big, belly real big, everything real big. To add a touch of authenticity to the game, Rockstar partnered with Dub Magazine in development, properly tapping into the world of urban car culture. As well as informing content, Dub's consultancy helped keep Rockstar's finger on the pulse of car culture throughout its development. Sort of like a military contractor consulting on a Call of Duty modern warfare game. Game development is a long-winded process, so that edge of being able to look ahead to what would engage gamers in the future was invaluable. Midnight Club is often forgotten in the shadow of the Need for Speed Goliath, but few who remember it have a bad word to say. Before we move on to the rest of our list, we'd just like to say thank you very much for watching this video. We really appreciate it, and if you are enjoying it, do remember to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Now, on with the rest. And then, for many, the world of car games changed forever. Away from small, largely made up maps or recreations of circuits, Test Drive Unlimited had a bonkers one-to-one -one scale map of the Hawaiian island Oahu, complete with its mountain ranges, urban cityscapes and intricate road network. You could even expand your digital world away from car ownership. There were houses you could buy, dealerships you could visit away from the countless races you could take part in, all with basically zero story. Admittedly, today, some of that does sound a bit stale. Now you can do all sorts in countless games that leave the customization and configuration almost unlimited, but back then, the fact that you could log on and go for a road trip with your mates around Hawaii, well, it was mind-blowing. This one is perhaps our script writer's favourite car game of all time, helping him to waste hours of the prime of his life in a fictional world. Five years before Forza Horizon would arrive, Test Drive Unlimited did it already, and bigger and better. Even now, over eight years after the servers were finally turned off, dedicated PC players host private ones for modded versions. Talk about standing the test of time. Gran Turismo had had it all its own way for far too long come 2007. It was about time someone came along and made another sim racing game for consoles that matched it. Along came Forza Motorsport 2, the second in a series that if you add Horizon will soon stretch to 13 games. The first game had established some trademarks for the franchise. A great car list, good crisp car sounds, excellent physics, top quality graphics and an engaging career mode. Forza 2 took them and stepped them all up to the capabilities of the Xbox 360. The first one was great, but the second Forza game makes this list as it proved that Forza was here to stay. Believe it or not, the online servers are still up today, so if you can get hold of a 360 in Forza 2, you can still jump in with some friends, and probably no one else to mess your races up. The final beauty of Forza 2 was a bit of a sense of fun, something the newer titles seem to have lost to Horizon. For Forza Motorsport 8, the devs would do really well to just spend a little time playing Forza 2. Ah, we missed the Burnout series. It made the Need for Speed franchise look incredibly straight-faced and serious. It was a proper automotive escape to do stupid things without worrying. There hasn't been a proper Burnout game since the start of the last decade, and the last one to be released with the Burnout moniker was just a remaster of this, perhaps the highlight of the entire franchise, Burnout Paradise. Released in 2008, it was an open-world game set in the fictional Paradise City, with no apologies to Guns N' Roses. 
The car list was fictional but loosely based on reality, and while it was about racing, it was far more about just smashing. There was even a delightfully tacky showtime mode, which was effectively just a way to choreograph better smash-ups. Like Test Drive Unlimited, it is the pretty much limitless open world gameplay and excellent multiplayer that cements it in many hearts and minds. So when the remaster came out in 2018, we picked right back up where we left off. Those then are our favourite racing games of the 2000s. But what have we missed out? Is Gran Turismo 3 better than GT4? Should Forza 1 be the one on the list? Let us know in the comments below.